we make, you know, that's Joseph's kid. I know him. He can't be anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the thing is, people who had the idea that lived in Jesus' hometown that he was just Joseph's kid had already made up their mind about who he was. They hadn't considered who he actually is. And I think sometimes we do that. We think about Jesus, we think about God, and we've already set the boundaries of what we think he is. I don't know about y'all, but my little pea brain doesn't have a chance of gathering who God is, right? But just like them, when we set those boundaries on who we think God's going to be for us, we stop having the faith to believe that he will be what we need. You know what I mean? They said that in that passage it goes on to say he only did a couple of healings and laid hands on people and that was it because there wasn't any faith. But there's only not faith when we don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. And who he says he is, to me, is so much bigger than I can grasp. Amen. So when I'm thinking about who Jesus is, as we read this and we learn who he says he is as we go along Mark, the thing that I found to be true is people who've already decided have closed their hearts and are not trying to see it. They're not trying to be open to what God wants to show them about himself. But we need not to do that. We need to make sure that when we enter this moment and this space and these discussions, that our hearts are open to see and hear what God wants to tell us that's fresh, that's new, that's bigger than what we already thought. Because he is bigger. He's bigger than we know. He's going to be bigger than we know after until we die and see what he really is. That's just how it has to be. We don't have enough here for that. We don't have enough here for that. You know? But I'm so grateful because I have to be reminded of that. I have to be reminded that God is so much bigger than what I need. And I can't expect any less than that he loves me enough to give me what I need, whatever that is. I cannot. I can look for and I can expect him to show me how big he is. I don't have to wait, have decided who he is. I heard that story once, so I know that one. He has something to show me there if I will open my heart. But if I close my eyes and close my heart and think I already know everything, I have little faith and nothing changes. Okay? So just a, an encouragement to, as you read, ask God to show you himself, to show you new things, to open your eyes, to open your heart so that you won't be those people, you will be someone who had the faith to have the change. Father, I thank you so, so much for the way that you love us. I thank you that you're bigger than I know. I thank you that you're stronger than I know. I thank you that you care more than I know. And I thank you that you're there all the time. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds tonight, that we would leave here knowing more about you, seeing you differently, allowing ourselves to open our imaginations to what you want to tell us, to show us, to change us even, and to be willing to cooperate with it. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a question this week about are we skipping the beginning of Mark chapter 6? You just got it right there. <laughs> so, or not. So, um, but I did want to say that um, if, you, if you've been here since the beginning, you've already seen how rich and deep and full Mark is. It's, it's so deep and so much in there. And um, so sometimes I do a jet tour over the top of it and we cover it all. And sometimes I'm going to choose to pick out a piece and hone in on it, which means that sometimes we might look like we're skipping over it, but we're not. It's not like it's not important. And at the same time, I want you to read everything that's in the assigned passage and think about it. So uh, the guidelines for the questions that we have in the small group are just guidelines. If there's something in there you want to talk about, please bring it up. <laughs> if there's a word or a phrase or a verse that you say, wow, this is the most important thing to me, it's not even in the questions, you are not constrained by those questions. Whatever your heart you know, feels like you want to talk about or ask about, please do that. But today, I want to hone in on one part of chapter 6 specifically because I think it's really, really important. And it's requiring that we're going to jump around and look at the whole of the story 
and not just what's in Mark chapter 6. Because, you know, the Gospels have a whole lot of stories about miraculous interventions by God, right? I mean, we saw three last week, and if you remember, and you were here last week, you remember Diablo, our de demon-possessed man, and Jairus, and Olivia, his daughter who was raised from the dead, and Scarlet, the woman with the issue of blood, and you're going, what are those names? I've never heard those before. Go back and listen to last um, a session and it'll make more sense to you. Those are my made up names, but um, it helps us remember who they are. But there was miraculous stories, right? There was amazing things that happened when these people came and fell at the feet of Jesus. And uh, so we look at that story, those stories and stories like them, and we have hope, right? We're like, my, my crazy situation is not beyond Jesus' ability to be changed, to be resurrected, to be healed, whatever it is. There's nothing behind his power. So we love those stories, right, and like that, because they do give us hope. And there's other stories that are harder, right? Story from Moses in the Old Testament. He doesn't get to go into the promised land after all the stuff with the Israelites and putting up with that for so many years. Job, that's a hard story. <laughs> I mean, a righteous man who endures unimaginable suffering and doesn't get any answers that he's looking for. We understand what was happening by virtue of the scriptures, but he doesn't get the questions answered. Uh, David pleads in genuine repentance and remorse and mourning for the life of his infant son, and he dies. And there's no miracle that, there. And so we're not as much a fan of those stories because they make us uncomfortable, right? Because it doesn't seem like it matches what we want to happen. So I think it's good that on the heels of what we studied last week, that we uh, dig down into the one story in Mark chapter 6 that I want to talk about, which is the story of John the Baptist. And uh, his story is just plain hard. I mean, it just doesn't turn out the way we think it should. And so I want to look at it from beginning to end of every, pretty much everything that we know about John you know, an overview of that. We're going to jump around, like I said, all over the Gospels to get more details. Um, but I want to wrestle with some harder questions uh, with these, this story particularly raises so we can learn to hold on to our faith when things are confusing, when the story doesn't turn out the way we want it to. And so let's just jump in and start to get to know John a little bit. And remember, the first mention of John is in Luke's gospel when we find out that he's the miracle child born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And so right from the beginning, these first verses here tell us that he is set apart for special service to the Lord to prepare the way of Messiah. And in there, in verse 15, he says he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And his job is to turn, bring back to the Lord uh, the people of Israel. And he's going to go before, before the Lord to prepare the way for Messiah in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And so... They are going to, he's going to, this is his job to prepare the way for the Lord. And so then we, uh, that's the only thing we hear about John until he grows up, until we start hearing about his message. He's, he enters into his ministry and he starts preaching this bold message of repentance. Now we saw that back in Mark chapter 1 verses 4 to 8, I won't read all of that. But he's the one spent, sent in the spirit of Elijah. Remember we talked about his uh, clothing made of camel's hair and his leather belt. That was very much like what Elijah was like, what he wore when he, he preached. So he was in the spirit of Elijah, just like the angel told Zechariah that he would do, that this is what he would be. And then God, John's gospel goes on to tell us that he is the first to identify Jesus as Messiah. And you probably know this verse. John 1 29, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he goes on in the verses 32, 33, and 34, John gave testimony. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That is the Messiah. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Of God, And he's pretty confident, right? He knows who Jesus is because it's revealed to him by the Spirit of God. He has been given visual confirmation. This is the one. No mistake. That's the Lamb of God right there. So, I mean, this is not something you easily forget, right? This is a you know, big manifestation there. And so then he, we see John 
going on to preach a bold message of repentance, and he is not afraid to call out what he sees as error. And you see, you brood of vipers, he says to the Pharisees, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, this is not a soft and gentle message. This is not massaging them. He's not concerned about their feelings. He's not concerned about, you know, soft peddling the truth here. This is a bold denunciation of sin and compromise. And this was characteristic of John's message. He does not care about toning down the message of the gospel to powerful people either, which leads us to Mark chapter 6 uh, in our passage for today, where we see him saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's life. Now, so a little background on that. Herod is married to another woman, and Herodias, who will become his wife, is married to his brother. So they're married to separate people, but he becomes infatuated with her. And so uh, she was also, you might not know, that she was also the daughter of his half-brother, so his half-niece. So his brother and brother's wife and his half-niece, this is an early version of the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> but anyway, having absolutely no morals, doesn't care about anything like that, Herod decides he wants to marry her. So in order to do that, they each have to divorce their current uh, spouses. And so now Herodias is a ladder climber, and she's a status seeker, and she knows that Herod is going to be married to Herod is going to be more advantageous for her than being married to her current husband, so she wants to get hooked up to him. And so this is an amoral mess. This is terrible. And so John does not have any problem making them the, uh, the feature subject of his sermons and his messages that he brings. And so, surprising, uh, not surprisingly, Her Herodias does not like this a bit, which is what it says in verse 19. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she couldn't get her way because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to hear him. And so Herod is in a precarious position here. He knows John's a holy man. He likes to listen to him, doesn't quite understand his message, but he knows that there's something special about him. And on the other hand, his wife is vehemently opposed to John because he embarrasses her in public. So the way Herod tries to get around this is by, is by having John arrested and put in jail. And that's what we get from uh, verse 17. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, had him bound and put in prison. And so he says plainly here he did this because of Herodias. He didn't want to do it, but he kowtows to her. And so what he, he ends up staying in prison, John the Baptist, for a better part of two years. And then we come to the part of John's story in Matthew chapter 11 that's one of the most difficult, I think, parts of the New Testament. Not difficult to understand, but difficult to really process is a, probably a better way to put it. Um, these verses here in Matthew chapter 11 are basically a status update on John. And so as these months of imprisonment wore on, disappointment, discouragement, doubt began to set in, and John sends his followers to Jesus with this question. And he says, ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shouldn't you expect somebody else? And you want to go, what? <laughs> I mean, now, we could take this question if it was from Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus says, are you the one, or should we expect somebody else? Or maybe from Peter, because it's not out of character for him to ask some weird question, right? And so, or it could, could it come from any number of people that Jesus met on the roads and in the cities and on his travels? But, and we're okay with that, but from John the Baptist, it's hard. That's a hard question. He's the chosen guy, right? He is God's prophet to prepare the way for Jesus. We just saw the verse. Hold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, that's no doubt in that. It's a gospel message in one statement that John makes. But, I mean, if anybody knew who Jesus, that Jesus was the one, it would be John, right? I mean, we think, and yet here he is in these verses expressing some pretty strong doubts. It makes it a little uncomfortable, right? And we're going, yeah, that's hard. Um, and then if we look at the passage for in Mark chapter 6, this story gets worse. 
where John's death becomes little more than a horrific joke and a public mockery. And it is in Mark chapter 6, it's told in flashback form. So um, John hears about Jesus and what Jesus is doing and healing things, and he's afraid. And it says right here, when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. So spoiler alert, this is what he has done to him. But he's afraid that John has been raised from the dead and is going to judge him or, or whatever he's concerned about. But so if we look at this, we, we have to see, like I said, this is in flashback form. So look in verse 21 where we get what happens. Finally, an opportune time came. So this is Herodias that tells us that this wasn't happenstance. This wasn't just... Just it sort of was a good opportunity, but Herodias has been planning something just to get her way and get rid of John for a long time. And, and she wants to have him executed, so Herod's birthday shows up, and she's like, now my plan, I'm going to put it in to, uh, in, in to gonna get it going here. So on his birthday, Herod made a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. So there's all the big important people have come to his party. Now, just as a side note, birthday parties in this time were pagan celebrations. Jews did not celebrate birthdays. They did not approve of these gatherings because of the decadence that went on during these uh, parties. And for the Romans, birthday parties were full of revelry, often full of uh, overindulgence, gluttony, drunkenness, and all kinds of deviance that they would have at these parties. So, they were for men only. There were no women invited to these parties because you notice as we go on the story, Herodias is not at this party. She's outside. She's uh, paying attention to what's going on, but she's not in and among the people who had come to the party. If you remember back to our study of Esther, the same was true for parties in Persia, if you remember that. Men only. Women of any kind of social status, any kind of of, of of, you know, stature in the community would never dare go to a party like that. And so then we see that the daughter of Herodias, other passages in scripture tell her, us her name is Salome. So when Salome came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. Now, we have heard this story so many times, most of us who have been in church, that we don't get the shock factor of this. Uh, these types of dances that were done here uh, were regularly performed by professional dancers, if you know what I mean, who are low character women, hired girls to entertain this room full of drunken men. And that was an almost unprecedented thing, like I said, for someone of social status to be at this party, let alone to perform a dance at this party. And now, I, when I was studying this passage right here, I did note that some of the uh, commentators were saying that people who are critics of the Bible often point to this story right here as reason to say, well, the facts are probably not right in the Bible because that a, a woman of noble birth wouldn't be here. It's so uh, opposite and so opposite what went on in the culture. They say, well, somebody had to make this up because it wouldn't have been the way. But that's the point, that the shock factor is what Herodias was after. It was outrageous for her uh, Herod's stepdaughter to perform at a party like this, but that's exactly what Herodias was after because she, and she shows us just as how far she was willing to go to even degrade her own daughter to get what she wanted. And so she knew that this was going to throw everybody for a loop because of its extreme nature. And now this is not just some nameless prostitute on display, but Herod's own stepdaughter and uh, this gets Herod too. He doesn't expect this, which is what Herodias was counting on. And so see how far down in debauchery this goes? But the impact is exactly what she was after. And he says, after he sees her, he says, he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And if you remember back from our study in Esther in, this, in the spring, this is almost the exact same words that Xerxes used with Esther, different context, of course, but it, the meaning was the same. This was not literal, because the irony here is that King Herod didn't have control of his kingdom. He only ruled at the uh, behest of, of Rome. So he couldn't give away his kingdom if he wanted to. So, so 
but it just meant that he was going to be generous and give her whatever she asked. That's just, it was just a colloquial phrase there. And, but he makes this foolish, over-generous oath in front of all his prominent guests, and now he's kind of bound to it. And so the trap that Herodias has set for him springs on him. And so she, Salome runs out and says to her mother, what shall I ask for? Now Salome probably knew that Herodias was something, or was up to something, but until this moment she doesn't know what it is. And so she, she says, you know, I want the head of John the Baptist. And at once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give it to me right now. And that right now really means immediately before the party's over, not giving him time to sober up, not giving him time to think through this, to change his mind, and to figure out some way to protect John. So what she ends up doing is he was greatly distressed because of his oaths. He didn't want to refuse her, so he caves, immediately sent an executioner with order to bring John's head. He was beheaded, brought back his head on a platter, gave it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. Now, that's hard, right? That's a hard story. I mean, this story does not seem to meld very well with the other stories that we've read so far in this gospel, right? I mean, we see a lot of miracles here. And it doesn't meld very well with a lot of other things we see in Scripture where God's righteous and faithful people are eventually vindica vindicated and elevated. And, I mean, where's the save the day moment for John? Mm. And it doesn't seem like Jesus is paying much attention to it. But then maybe you know exactly what that's like. You feel like sometimes Jesus is not paying much attention to you. You expected life to turn out one way. It just didn't end up that way, right? Just didn't end up with that. Sickness stole something. Sin broke something. Selfishness of you, yourself, or the selfishness of somebody else took something that just can't be returned. As you try to make sense of these things that have happened in your life, looking back over, either near or far, have you ever felt yourself silently wondering something very close to what John thought? Is Jesus the one? Or maybe I should expect somebody else. Is there something else out there that will promise me and deliver what I'm really looking for? Now, I don't have this claim to have any answers for these really hard and difficult uh, problems, desperate situations that people find themselves after tragedy and heartache, shattered dreams. I mean, we all have things like that in our lives. But I think if we go back to Matthew chapter 11 and look at what Jesus said to John and see Jesus' answers there, uh, it might help us hold on to our faith when we feel ourselves slip into our own prisons of despair. So let's get back to Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 11. There's our question. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect somebody else? And then Jesus answers... Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. And in this one sentence, this one statement here, but Jesus basically paraphrases the Messianic uh, 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 prophecy. It's found in Isaiah 61. And through it, he reminds John and he reminds us to widen out our vision. Stop focusing in on just what's happened to us and look at the bigger picture. So when our expectations and reality really don't match up that well, we need to remember that there's often something bigger going on that we can't see or quite understand from our vantage point. Something that has bigger, more internal ramifications than we could ever really grasp. Um, the natural inclination for us is to be just like John and to go, maybe I got it wrong from the start. Maybe I missed something. But Jesus goes on to say in verse 6, he says, Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me, which essentially challenges us to examine the basis of our belief. Are we followers of Christ because of what he does for us? Or are we followers of Christ because we know who is. That's a big difference right there. So have we been tracking with Mark all along? Remember verse 1 of chapter 1 that this is the beginning of the gospel. 
of, the, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's the whole point of the whole book is to tell us and point us back to who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. And so if we're tracking along with him so far, we see his identity. We see his authority. We see his character. We see his power. And we can come to the realization that just as he is declared in unmistakable fashion over and over and over again to the people who asked him the question, Jesus says, I'm God. Very plainly and simply, he says it. And it is a question, though, we have to grapple with every single time that heartache and suffering touches our lives. Are we following Jesus for what he does for us, or are we following Jesus because we know who he is? So, let's wrap up this story. Look at all the great things that, Je that Jesus goes on to say about John. It says in verse 7, Jesus spoke to the crowd about John. Why did you go out to the desert to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom is written, I shall send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. So John's confirmed, I mean, Jesus is confirming there that John is operating in that spirit of Elijah that the angels said and that we saw in Mark in chapter 1 and like the Old Testament prophesied that he would be. And so he elevates John and he lauds his faithfulness and his part in heralding the coming of the kingdom and in his coming, the coming of the Messiah. Then he says, I tell you the truth, this is an awesome statement here, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Wow, right? Wow. I mean, just, this is a bold statement of John's faithfulness and his contribution to what's going on to the big, huge plan of God. No one born greater of woman than John the Baptist. Now, if you just flip back through your Bible and just start at the beginning, this includes Abraham, David, Elijah, Moses, Isaiah, Solomon, and on and on and on we go. And Jesus is saying, no one. Now, I'm sure this threw the Pharisees for a loop. We thought <laughs> Abraham and Moses were the top. But Jesus is saying, John the Baptist, no one is greater than him. And uh, it tells you just how pivotal pivotal of a part that John the Baptist played in God's story. Here's the weird part. Jesus doesn't tell John that. Verse 7, as John's disciples were leaving. So the John's disciples have asked this question and they're gone. Jesus started to speak to the crowd about John, right? Jesus doesn't tell John's disciples to say go and tell him that he's done a great job. That's not what they say. He only tells them to look around at the prophecies of the old that they are being fulfilled in Jesus. That's what he tells them to tell John. Now, why is that? Because it seems like an attaboy for John would be awesome right now, right? He's been in jail for two years. He doesn't know what's going on. He can't preach. He doesn't know what's going on. It seems like that would help John out. But what I think is happening here is Jesus is really about something more important than giving John praise at this morning. At this point, Jesus points John uh, to the truth about who he is and what he's doing. He says, "Look at what's happening here. What I'm doing here," because he doesn't want John to find his confidence in the work that he did. He wanted to find his confidence in the work that Jesus did and would ultimately do on. The cross. That's where he needed to find his encouragement. Not, hey, John, you're doing a great job. Look how amazing you are. He's saying, look at how amazing I am. Get your focus off of you, off your circumstances, and on to what's really going on. So Jesus tells John's disciple, go tell John the gospel spreading, the lame are healed, the blind are see, the deaf hear. Tell John the good news has come to the poor. Tell John all of that. You tell him that. Tell him that everything that was written about Messiah in the Old Testament is being revealed in me, right in front of your eyes. All the things that he's hearing secondhand are true. See the evidence of what's happening right in front of you. And I think Jesus might have added, maybe, look at me, John. I'm here. I am the lamb, just like you said I was. Don't forget that, John. 
Put your confidence there. And the point here, that I think, is Jesus saying to them and to us is your confidence is never to be in the work that you do. Your confidence must always be in Jesus. And also your confidence is never to be what your circumstances are. That's not a good barometer of what God is doing. I mean, sometimes they go really south, but God is doing amazing work in us. Your confidence must be always in what Jesus does. And he's saying that to, that to us right here today. You may be working hard. You may be working right in the center of what God wants you to do, the whole purpose for your life. But you look around at your life and you're going, but everything's falling apart. It's not the way I thought it was going to be. And you're struggling with how things have turned out. And, but don't find your value and your worth in those things. Don't rest your faith in your ability. And on the other hand, maybe you're just brand new back to church. You haven't been in a long time. You struggle with the whole church thing, and you're just starting to think about God again for the first time in a long time. And the same is true if you're a believer. Don't think that your worth or value is negated by what you have done either. Mm. Okay? So the point is, our efforts, our efforts as believers, neither add nor take away from what is given to us through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus says to John, lame walk, blind see, dead or raised, gospel is announced. So be sure your eyes are in the right place. Not on your efforts, but resting wholly on him. It's not about us. It's about him. And I love the bluntness of Psalm 115, verse 1. We need to be reminded of this. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name. Be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. This is a really good one to, uh, to memorize and to hang on to. Every, when you think, oh, he doesn't appreciate me, she doesn't appreciate me, or they got the credit, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. You know, there, we talk, talk about those stories that we see the person suffer disappointment, and they're exalted like Esther or like Joseph in the Old Testament. And then there's the story of John. Disappointment, doubt, struggle. And it doesn't have a happy ending on this earth. It just doesn't. So I want us to look at right here at the end of our time together at the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. You've probably heard it called the Hall of Faith, maybe. And uh, there's this whole list of faithful fo promise, uh, followers of God all through the Old Testament. Noah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those guys we're so familiar with. They're great stories. And then you, uh, you go down to verse 32. And it says, gives us more, without giving us the story, it says, what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, or prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Love that, right? That's awesome. We're good. Like that. Good so far. Then we go. Others were tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging. Others were still chained, put in prison. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death by the sword, went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, mountains, caves, holes in the ground. In verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. So don't get distracted by the end there. Let me just help you with uh, verse 39. It says they, don't receive what, they didn't receive what was promised. That doesn't mean their faith was in vain or that God didn't uh, fulfill them or he let them down. It means that their faith... Uh, that they believed God and they suffered for him and they never saw the fulfillment of what their faith was in. That is the coming of the Messiah. They looked forward, in this case, hundreds of years to God's promise that he would sing, send a redeemer and then he would send someone to save his people from their sin and bring it, it, us all into a glorious, everlasting kingdom of righteousness. That's what they were looking forward to. It didn't happen in their lifetime. Uh, but the, and the other thing to note here is that with all that stuff that happened to him, this persecution and hardship, they were commended for their faith. 
Uh, there were hard stories, and no doubt that there were family members and friends that are around them that, that saw these things happen and were very confused. I mean, saw it in two, that's a hard verse, right? <laughs> I mean, that is difficult. And uh, it was confounding, no doubt, for the people who lived through it. They were commended for their faith. So faith in Jesus doesn't always end in the save-the-day moment. It just doesn't. Uh, the point here is not to scare us about persecution, but to strengthen our faith in God when we do face difficulties. When we, uh, we can't remain steadfast when our lives don't have the wonders and the miracles that we really prefer. Uh, they, you know, so they were faithful looking forward toward the Messiah and their faith was commended. So we can be even more faithful because we look backwards toward the fulfillment. We have seen. We have heard. We do have es uh, testimonies of Scripture. We do know. So we can look back at all that Jesus has done, and uh, which helps us be faithful right now, and to hold on to our faith, to look forward, ultimately, to the promise. What uh, Hebrews eleven thirteen talks about, it says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they all, all, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Verse 16 said, instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's why we have to place our expectations somewhere besides in this world. And look for... And then not look for just our affirmations from this life. We have to look beyond. We have to look, set our hopes on what we can count on as believers. And that is Jesus alone. It's, and it rests in who he is. Only he can deliver on the promise of a disappointment-free future that extends far beyond the few years that we have on this earth. It's what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 15. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are the most we are people of all most pity. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. So don't put everything in this life, right? I mean, look around. Is this all you want? Look at this world, the crazy mix-ups things that are going on in this world. Is this all you hope for? And if you would say no, then don't anchor your hope here. Certainly don't anchor your faith here, right? Jesus promised us, remember from last week, what he didn't promise is that health, wealth, and happiness. He said, I promise you that in this world you'll have trouble. Right? But he said that he is the only way to overcome that trouble. Not having the best version of the life that you want. That's not the way you overcome. He is the way you overcome. Because remember, all this burns, right? Everything that you put hope in in this life, if it's not Jesus, it all burns. The only things that remain are the things that last for eternity and eternal things, the way God tells us they are. So you need to have a faith that will carry you through the devastation that comes from sin, flesh, devil. And, you know, that's what Jesus was telling John. He said, it's not about what you've done. It's about what I have done. It's about me. So what does that do for us in the meantime? Do we just grit, grit our teeth and bear it and just uh, have to brace ourselves against the onslaught of the sin and the world and Satan and just hope for the best? That's definitely not what we do. God doesn't leave us here just to endure alone and, and to just get through it the best we can. We have a God who is greater than any of these unexplainable situations uh, in in. And for his children, he always delivers on the promise to birth good from the ashes of the bad. Now, do we always see it right now? Sometimes we have to wait, right? But we can trust that promise that what's happening to us is not for no reason. We have to believe on that. And if we will hang on to what we know and trust that who he is, he will be the one and only, right? Are you the one? Yes. He's the one, the one and only. So the exhortation we need at the end of a hard story like this is found at the end of uh, this chapter in 1 uh, Corinthians 15. Is no matter where you find yourself, no matter what has happened, no matter what doubts you have, and what they swirl around in your head, 
uh, because of your difficult past or present or future, remember this. This is Paul's exhortation that we need to remember. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That is thing when things are tough, when they're disconcerting, when they're confusing, anchor yourself to the truth and don't move. Give yourself to the work of the Lord fully, being confident that it is not in vain. You may not see how it works. You may not see who you impacted. You may not see how it all works out. But it does have meaning. That's what he said. It is not in vain. Look around you. That's what Jesus said to John. The gospel is preached. The kingdom of God is moving forward. Your part is done, John, he might have said. But it's not in vain. It was valuable. For us, it is also valuable. So don't rest your hope in the now or how you thought it was going to go or in the strength of your own ability. Set your eyes on Jesus. Stand firm no matter how your story ends on this earth. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that uh, you are greater than all the unexplainable things and that we don't have to figure it out. Thank you for that, that we can just trust what you say. That when we give ourselves to you, when we are fully committed, when we follow you, that the things we do for your kingdom are not in vain. God, help us to see this world with the eyes of faith so that we know that even when we're confused and our hearts break and our hearts hurt and we don't understand, that we can trust you because not because of what you do for us, but because of because of who you are in us and through us. Mm. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.